I understand that Johannesburg means the place of gold. In this sense, we just cannot find a better place to chart the course for a golden decade than in this city of gold. We should help African countries develop their economic structures, contribute to the implementation of the African Union's Agenda 2063, and thus enable Africa gain strong vitality. BRICS countries have now entered the golden decade. That's according to Chinese President Xi Jinping at the just concluded 10th BRICS summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. Within just a decade's time, BRICS have grown into the world's most influential grouping of emerging economies, representing 40% of the world population and making up 22% of the global GDP. So what more does the golden decade hold? And here in Africa, what opportunities does that offer for the continent in its own drive for industrialization and sustainable development? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now let's first take a look at some of the highlights coming from the 2018 BRICS Summit. The three-day summit concluded with leaders of the five countries signing the Johannesburg Declaration in an action plan. Issues of mutual concern aimed at achieving development, economic growth and prosperity, as well as peace and security, were outlined. While well, the group unified their stance on strengthening multilateralism in both political and economic matters and rejecting unilateralism and trade protectionism. They also reaffirmed their commitment to the WTO to ensure a rules-based, transparent, open and inclusive trading system. Agreement has been reached that investment-led trade would be the end goal to ensure more complementary and equitable intra-BRICS trade. The BRICS Business Council also launched a host of new projects to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and skills between the five countries to enable them seize the full potential presented by the fourth industrial revolution. And echoing the theme of this year, BRICS countries have pledged to continue supporting African development, industrialization and infrastructural development as contained in the NEPAD programs and the African Union's Agenda 2063. In addition, a BRICS Women's Forum, a BRICS Vaccine Center, and a BRICS Tourism Track were also established. Well, let's now hear more about uh, BRICS in the golden decade. And I'm joined by my panel of guests in Johannesburg. We have Sherry Donaldson. She's the director of the BRICS Institute. In Beijing, Professor Chiang Shishui, he's the director of the Center for Latin America Studies at Shanghai University. And with me in studio is David Owiro, an independent economic consultant and African political affairs analyst. Thank you all for joining in the conversation. Uh, Sherry Donaldson, let me start off with you in uh, Johannesburg because... China's President Xi Jinping talked of the next 10 years as a golden decade for the BRICS bloc. Let's look back at the past 10 years. What has been achieved and what are some of the milestones of the last 10 years? I think the milestones have been learning to work together, learning to understand each other. There's definitely been improvements, definitely from South Africa's side, improvements in trade with BRICS countries. And in fact, some of the BRICS countries are now some of our biggest trading partners. Um, China and India specifically um, and I think it's taken a while but I, my sense is that we are collaborating better and that we're working better together. Um, I also work in two of the working groups on the BRICS Business Council which has only been in existence five years and that um, those relationships have taken time but I'm also sensing there that we're starting to gain a lot of traction. Right. So definitely trade and that's definitely one of the biggest objectives but culturally huge, huge changes and huge progress, I think. David, South Africa is the only uh, African member of the BRICS bloc, though, but uh, looking at it from an African perspective, though, what has stood out for you in the last 10 years? Uh, one of the biggest things that have stood out for me has been the increasing voice, uh, the African voice being uh, uh, at least present in this decision-making uh, fora. And so the BRICS initiative is just one further push that... Um, uh, enhances Africa's voice within the global economic governance uh, um, uh, framework. And so um, we are seeing a convergence of visions. Uh, 
at least Africa's agenda 2063 is being espoused even from this BRICS conference. We see uh, uh, rec recognition of the infrastructure deficit that uh, is within Africa and the commitment uh, within the African Union, but also for BRICS uh, to uh, focus on that challenge and to provide uh, perhaps resources in terms of financial resources, but also support for achieving that vision. Professor Chiang in Beijing, the uh, President Xi talked about uh, the next decade being a golden decade for the BRICS. So what will be the next 10 years? Why will the next 10 years be a golden decade for the BRICS from China's perspective? In the past decade, uh, there is one, one great achievement for BRICS cooperation. That's the establishment of the new development bank, the so-called BRICS Bank. So this bank is really very important in terms of BRICS cooperation. And, uh, well, regarding your question, well, we have to say that in the past decade, BRICS cooperation has achieved a lot. So we can, we can say that in the next decade, there should be more cooperation, there should be more achievements based on the past, uh, just based on the past decade. As Xi Jinping said that uh, there should be more political dialogues uh, among the BRICS members so that, so that uh, there can be a, a kind of more political consensus. And also in terms of trade and investment, uh, there will be uh, more possibilities of uh, deepening uh, trade. Uh, and also people-to-people -people exchanges are going to uh, uh, to move forward. Now, in the past decade, these BRICS leaders have put forward a very clear roadmap for the next decade. So we are going to see that uh, there should be more actions, well, so, so that we can turn uh, words into deeds, okay? And uh, as I said just now, uh, I will say that uh, BRICS have pointed out that they are going to cooperate in right. every field. So, so that in the next decade, I will say the, uh, these five emerging economies should pinpoint some of the most important areas. And if you ask me what is the most important areas, right. I will say that's on uh, the pushing forward the so-called global governance on all stage and trade and investment cooperation. Words, turning words into deeds. Sherry Donaldson, though, when you look at the size of the BRICS countries, though, they account for 40% of the global population, 26% of the global land, 22% of global GDP, and 17% of global trade. So how can BRICS countries, though, seize this to leap forward into the golden era, as Professor uh, Xinhua says there, turning words into deeds? So I think practical projects that are underway in a lot of the various forums, both government and business, will start turning de words into deeds. So if you read the declaration, there are a number of new initiatives and a number of new projects detailed in that declaration, things like the partnership um, on the fourth industrial revolution um, and how do we address that as a BRICS block and how do we practically respond to the challenges that the fourth industrial revolution brings to developing economies. Things like projects within the BRICS Business Council working group structures. We've got um, a BRICS rating agency on the card, and this is please not a complete list of projects, but we've got the BRICS skills challenge, we've got the BRICS rating agency, we've got a potential BRICS credit card. Um, we have a lot of cross manufacturing projects. We have a non-trade barriers investigation project. We have visa easing of visa requirements across the five countries. So I think there are a lot of projects underway that will definitely move us from words to deeds. Uh, David, I was just wondering about the whole question of inclusivity and uh, you know, sharing prosperity with the fourth industrial uh, revolution here. But when you look at African countries, though, many of them still have a fledgling uh, technological uh, capacity. So how exactly is this uh, shared prosperity or inclusivity going to be achieved uh, among countries of the global south when many of them still have uh, you know, fledgling technological capacity? Yes, yeah, certainly that is a question, and uh, I think that's a challenge of this South-to-South -South cooperation. Uh, when you look at BRICS, the big common factor is China and the advancement that China has made, especially in the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution. 
So uh, China is already a leader in uh, issues such as nanotechnology, biotechnology, and uh, Internet of Things and those kind of issues. And so when you come and look at the challenges within Africa, the opportunity lies in Africa, African nations, which are perhaps not part of BRICS, going out very proactively to enter even into bilateral investment treaties with members of the BRICS themselves so that they can also get benefits from whatever cooperation levels that are going on or are being advanced within the BRICS nations. And so certainly there is an opportunity, but it, it will rely upon uh, African nations, individual Afri African nations who are not part of the BRICS to be proactive in their uh, bilateral investment treaties so that they can reap from the benefits of this. Right. Sherry, I do, I do just want to get a, a feeling from you about that whole um, opportunity. What are these opportunities that David is talking about, though, that Africa can jump onto that BRICS bandwagon, particularly in driving its own growth for industrialization? Okay, so I think the first thing, Africa needs infrastructure. Um, we need energy, we need water, we need power, we need railroads, we need all of those kind of things to drive economic growth. Um, and I think the opportunities exist to use projects, as I said, um, Professor mentioned the New Development Bank. So the opportunities to use pro funding opportunities such as the New Development Bank and all of the other infrastructure development banks around to develop that infrastructure. So the opportunities to use those and then to create the framework for economic growth. I also think that there is huge opportunity within the fourth industrial revolution to utilize the disruptive technologies that are coming into play to leapfrog, um, to leapfrog existing structures and existing methods of business. So for example, if you look at Africa's penetration in the mobile phone market, um, Africa grabbed the mobile phone market and created a huge number of business opportunities around that because it didn't have a fixed telecoms network. Um, we predominantly didn't have that. So those disruptive technologies create fantastic and amazing opportunities for Africa. We just need to identify them, we need to jump on them really fast, and we then need to find ways of selling those and becoming part of the market value chains. Right, uh, Sherry Donaldson, we'll leave it there for the moment, but do stay with us uh, on the program. We are going to take a short break, but when we return, we'll take a look at Africa's opportunities in the BRICS cooperation. Stay tuned. China Global Television Network, from broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms, and social media. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back. Now, while in Johannesburg for the 10th BRICS Summit, I spoke to Professor Anil Suklal, a BRICS Sherpa. He explained how BRICS countries and Africa can work together in the coming golden decade. Let's listen in. Talking about African countries, we've seen a large presence of African leaders in this summit. What is the message that was being sent out on that? Very strong message that when BRICS leaders meet, they meet and deliberate on all of these global challenges, not just about themselves, but it's about the global south, and Africa is very much part of that. And the common message that came through from all of the African leaders that they fully embraced the outcome document of the Johannesburg Summit. They indicated that all of the critical issues raised there, the, the global governance issues, the global governance reform issues, defending uh, multilateralism and the UN system, defending the WTO, they fully embraced all of the outcomes and identified themselves fully with all of these issues. So that's a very strong message of cooperation, a strong message of sol solidarity between the countries of uh, Africa, the BRICS and the Global South in terms of wanting to create a better and more harmonious global environment than a stratified and divided world. When we talk about uh, inclusivity, though, in growth, uh, as has been pronounced under the Fourth Industrial Revolution, though, uh, how pragmatic is that going to be for African countries? And exactly how can African countries then uh, partner with the BRICS countries to leverage on that front? Well, we already have very dynamic partnerships between Africa and several of the BRICS countries. You have the uh, Africa-India summit 
uh, that brings India and African countries together every three years in a summit format. Then you have FOCAC, the Forum of China-Africa Cooperation, that brings all of the African countries in a partnership with China. In fact, we'll be having the third FOCAC summit uh, in September this year in Beijing. And very importantly, President Putin, in addressing the uh, summit outreach program, indicated that Af uh, uh, Russia is going to call a first ever Russia-Africa summit. Now you can see how BRICS has played a very catalytical role in ensuring that you have closer cooperation between Russia and, and, and the African continent. Of course, Brazil being part of the Latin America Africa uh, summit, uh, you already have that mechanism there. Brazil is very much part of it. So each of the African countries have a dynamic relationship bilaterally with all of the BRICS countries, but you also have these special mechanisms that focuses on each of the BRICS countries together with Africa. Well, let's continue our discussion now. Welcome back to the program. My guests are still standing by. Sherry Donaldson is in Johannesburg. She's the director of the BRICS Institute. Professor Chiang Shishue is in Beijing. He's the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at Shanghai University. And with me in studio is David Dewiro, an independent economic consultant and a political analyst. Welcome back to the program. Uh, Sherry Donaldson, upholding the values of multilateralism as opposed to protectionism, was one of the key focus or the main focus, though, of the uh, summit. How can the BRICS countries, though, uh, provide a leadership at this time of protectionism? I think in terms of their response, it, it came across to me in, in very well considered and very statements-like kind of response to what's happening in the events around the world with the trade, trade stuff that's happening. Um, and I think that we are seeing the start of a better understanding of the power of the BRICS grouping and then link to that the power of the BRICS plus grouping um, in the, the power of the response and in what is acceptable act action and what is not acceptable reaction and in the support for the world structures that monitor and um, regulate those kind of trade environments. Um, things like support for the UN, support for the um, programs within the UN, support for the World Trade Organization. And a lot of that came across in the Joburg Declaration. And I think the statesman-like manner in which the BRICS leaders responded, um, but the very clear direction of, we will not accept anything less than right. what's already agreed to and our, our rightful place uh, Professor Chiang, of course, China is a major player now on the African continent. And of course, uh, in terms of globalization and trade, Africa is going to be looking uh, to China's leadership. So how can BRICS countries, though, provide uh, that uh, leadership at this time? Uh, I would like to suggest that uh, BRICS can accept more African members into BRICS. And on the other hand, on the international stage, particularly in the framework of the WTO, BRICS and uh, some other African countries can push forward the so-called Doha round negotiation. Now, if you want to uh, push forward multilateralism to fight against unilateralism in the U.S., we must do something. And one of the best way is to push forward the so-called Doha round. So if the Doha round can be completed as soon as possible, that will be good for the emerging economies and also that will be good uh, for all the African countries. And I think uh, BRICS should uh, uh, deepen their political consultation to narrow their, uh, their differences in terms of this kind of uh, the so-called Doha round right. so that uh, uh, BRICS and Africa can cooperate in a more effective way on the framework of WTO. As we talk about this though, uh, David, Africa's share of global trade is about 1% uh, and intra-Africa trade is still a paltry 13% uh, and yet African heads of state are saying that they want uh, to be major players uh, in, in, in global trade. So exactly how does Africa plan on expanding their share of global trade? I think uh, one of the big initiatives is the continental free trade uh, agreement that is being pursued. Uh, basically turning the entire continent into a single market. That will certainly increase inter-African trade. 
um, and we'll build not only uh, global value chains but uh, regional value chains where you have more cross-border trade happening. And um, at the same time, when you look at Africa's participation within global economic governance uh, forums, we are definitely seeing the African voice being uh, more articulated. And so that's always a plus because it results in African priorities being also in convergence with global uh, priorities. And, uh, and so this way, perhaps Africa can actually be able to uh, have a greater output in terms of uh, trade uh, within the global trading framework. Right. Yeah, Sherry Donaldson, in terms of opportunities for Africa, though, to expand its uh, a share of the global trade, particularly with the BRICS countries now taking a lead in uh, uh, matters of uh, globalization and multilateralism, what are the opportunities for Africa? So I think um, we've already mentioned the complementarity process, and I think there is definitely stuff in there. If um, under the manufacturing working group, we're running a project called Exponential Manufacturing, which looks at new disruptive technologies. I think in the agriculture space, there is a huge opportunity for Africa to feed both bricks and the world um, in both um, kind of raw product and processed products. Um, we should be able to produce that better and cheaper and faster and more healthily locally. And also if you think of the global e um, climatic impact of transporting stuff like that around the world, um, there definitely seems to be huge op opportunities in the agricultural and agri-processing sector. And then energy. Africa has some of the most amazing natural resources in the world. We can power Africa and we can power other parts of the world where we need it. Battery technology and those kind of technologies are also changing rapidly. And there's no reason that in five, ten years' time we won't be able to transport electricity in the same way that we transport fuel now. So I think there is a huge number of opportunities pending for Africa. Right. Uh, Sherry, but when we look at the way um, many countries in Africa, though, um, cooperate with countries of uh, the BRICS bloc, we find that there are many bilaterals uh, between countries of the BRICS uh, member states and African countries. Is it better, though, for African countries to trade with the BRICS as a bloc as opposed to a bilateral agreement? I definitely think so, because I think if you look at the buying power of an individual South Africa versus the buying power of an Africa, and the supply power, again, in the same way, I definitely think that you can utilize the advantage of the size of Africa and the potential that that gives into the world economy and into the BRICS economies in a much more um, efficient manner than we currently do. Right. Uh, Professor Xiang, uh, to realize that golden uh, decade that President Xi has been talking about, though, the BRICS will need some collaboration from the Global South and particularly from uh, or also from African countries here. So how can Africa seize this opportunity though, to benefit from the BRICS golden decade? Well, when you talk about the BRICS cooperation with the African countries, I think uh, we are talking about uh, this issue in two dimensions. One is the so-called bilateral between one specific BRICS member cooperation with these African countries. And secondly, if you are talking about uh, BRICS, uh, the, uh, the so-called BRICS as a block, and I will say regarding the second possibility, uh, the BRICS as a block, well, I will say the possibility is quite slim. You know, uh, regarding the bilateral uh, cooperation between uh, one specific BRICS country, like China, India, uh, or, 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 uh, uh, or even Brazil, this, this kind of bilateral relationship between one specific BRICS member and Africa is developing very rapidly. But for BRICS as a bloc, well, I, I would say the possibility is not so great. So we need, to, we need to be clever enough to overcome this kind of handicap so that we can uh, uh, promote cooperation between BRICS as a bloc with uh, African continent. Right. Uh, David, you have yeah, a comment. Yeah, yeah I, I think I agree 110 percent. Um, when you look at the aspirations of BRICS when it was initially formed, it was largely to advance uh, a political um, uh, stance um, and basically to broaden the voices of these emerging uh, markets within the global economic governance uh, framework. And so that has actually been, uh, to some extent, uh, achieved. 
but uh, I think this is the opportunity for BRICS itself to reflect, and they've already done so because when you see the initiatives that already they're putting in place, they seem to be advancing towards an economic cooperation agenda as well. And so that is now the question uh, that I think uh, Professor is, is posing uh, very clearly that we need now to be very clever and think about how we can get BRICS as a block to uh, cooperate more with Africa. And so uh, that begs the, uh, you know, for BRICS to think of a solution uh, of how to perhaps better integrate, uh, you know, towards more economic cooperation. And this is in terms of putting in place perhaps trading frameworks, whether it's a preferential trading agreements, uh, and even common markets and even customs union, if possible. Right. Uh, Sherry, Dan also, though, in terms of uh, increasing its attractiveness as an investor-friendly destination, just how attractive would Africa be, if, though, for the BRICS states? I think one of the things that came across in the BRICS Business Forum last week was a request about certainty of policy and certainty of environment. Um, and that's one of, I think, the challenges that Africa faces in terms of um, attracting the investments and being a fantastic investment destination. But at the same time, as already said by both David and the professor, there are a lot of advantages in Africa. One, the size of the population, two, the agricultural opportunities, three, the investment and infrastructure opportunities, four, the natural resources, five, the tourism kind of opportunities. I think we just need to be cautious, though, in terms of natural resources, that we don't land up exporting raw natural resources. There needs to be some benefici beneficiation, there needs to be some processing that happens so that our local economies can develop and grow alongside of that. I also just want to add um, on the tourism opportunity, the fact is that tourism be can become such an important multiplier with manufacturing because for every tourist that comes and visits and stays in a country, you need bedding, you need linen, you need food, you need um, soaps, you need toiletries, all of those different things that are linked to tourism can exponentially drive a growth in manufacturing at the same time. But I think we need to be very clear as Africa about what our policies are, and we need to be a little bit more consistent about, about those policies to make it more investor-friendly, I think. Right. Uh, Professor Chiang, you have the final word, though, in terms of Africa providing a more viable environment for the uh, BRICS bloc. How would they do that? Well, uh, I would say uh, BRICS and Africa can cooperate on the, on the so-called multilateral stage, like the WTO. And the BRICS and African countries can join hands to voice their opposition against uh, the U.S. Trump's uh, trade protectionism. And that's also quite easy, and that's also necessary. So I would say the possibility of promoting cooperation between BRICS as a bloc and Africa is promising, but well, we need to take some uh, realistic actions so that uh, we can fulfill our promises. Professor Xiang Shishwe, we leave it there for the moment, and that's all we have time for this week. A very big thank you to our guests in Johannesburg, Sherry Donaldson. She's the director of the BRICS Institute in Beijing. Professor Xiang Shishwe is the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at Shanghai University. And with me in studio is David Owiro, an independent economic consultant and African political affairs analyst. Remember, we'd love to hear your feedback and do keep the conversation going online through our social media handles on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do tune in again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall, it's goodbye.